Now, I've got to be honest here, the prospect of a modern retelling of a classic story on fucking Netflix of all places generally fills me with the kind of dread normally experienced by Twitter employees at the prospect of having to actually work for a living. And yet there I was the other night with my pint of whiskey, watching All Quiet on the Western Front, absolutely gripped from the first brutal combat sequence to the tragic and haunting climax. And believe me, Tatiana can tell you all about tragic and haunting climax. <laughs> anyway, the point here is that it's become very easy for me to shit all over the idea of anything good being remade or reimagined today, because let's be honest, Hollywood doesn't exactly do themselves any favours in that regards. Hey, which story shall we fuck up today? All of them. But hey, wherever there's a gap in the market, sooner or later, someone else is going to step in to fill it. Whether it's South Korea giving us tight and compelling thrillers, or India delivering epic action movies, or in this case, Germany producing a potent, moving, and extremely well-crafted war movie that expands on its source material without losing the essence of what made it so awesome in the first place. All Quiet on the Western Front, a German anti-war novel based on the author's own experiences in World War One, was written way back in 1929, when the wounds of that conflict were still raw and painful. It's been adapted a whole bunch of times for the big and small screen over the years, and while I'll always respect the 1930 original, this is the first time we've been able to see the story told with the benefit of modern cinema technology to help it out. And holy shit, did they do it justice with this one. All Quiet on the Western Front is a remarkable movie that pulls absolutely no punches, tells its story faithfully and honestly, and I think it's one of those rare examples examples where deviating from the source material actually enhances rather than detracts from it. The story begins in the summer of 1917. The First World War has been raging for three years now, and as casualties mount, the German army is increasingly in need of fresh recruits. In steps Paul Baumer, a German teenager who fakes his parental permission form so that he can sign up for the German army and fight alongside his best friends. Spirits are high as the boys head off to war, fueled by patriotic speeches and dreams of adventure just like so many other young men before them. The fact that they're wearing uniforms stripped from their dead predecessors and hastily patched up is a pretty chilling taste of what's to come. Naturally, it doesn't take long for the harsh reality of trench warfare to hit them in the face, harder than a gender studies graduate trying to get a real job for the first time. Within minutes of arriving at the front line, the four friends are surrounded by mud, blood and death, and by the end of the first day, one of them's already been killed by an artillery strike, and Paul himself almost gets killed when his dugout collapses on top of him. It's a hard, brutal introduction to a hard and brutal war. Flash forward 18 months or so and things are looking bleak for the Germans. After four years of attrition and a series of crushing defeats, they're running out of men to feed into the meat grinder. Defeat seems inevitable, leaving them no choice but to sue for peace. But even as a delegation heads off to negotiate an armistice with the French, the German High Command orders a massive offensive in the hopes of improving their position. It's a pointless gesture of defiance, sacrificing thousands of lives on the altar of pride and ego, but nobody's willing to refuse orders so ahead it goes anyway. That means sending Paul and his unit back to the front line to keep fighting a war that's already been lost. But will any of them hope to survive the final destructive days of the First World War? And if they do, can they ever hope to return to the lives they once had? There's not many conflicts that better illustrate the horror and futility of warfare more than World War I, which is why it's been such a potent backdrop for anti-war movies and TV shows over the years. The image of lines of young men charging forward into certain death across a blasted wasteland of mud, wire and shell holes, dying by the thousands to gain just a few yards of territory that they'll lose in a counter-attack, is one of the most haunting and tragic to come out of the entire 20th century. And all quiet on the Western Front makes full use of it. Battles are disastrous, chaotic affairs where men are cut down before they even manage to get out of their own trenches, and even more are blown up and shot as they fight their way across no man's lands. Everything from artillery to tanks and flamethrowers are shown in unflinching detail. Fighting is bloody and brutal, and often ends up being done with knives, shovels and bayonets. And these costly advances are usually followed by chaotic retreats as the enemy counterattacks, driving the Germans right back to where they started. 
thousands of men dead for absolutely no gain. The battles themselves definitely show trench warfare at its worst, but some of the most revealing stuff happens when the fighting stops. Life in the trenches is a weird mixture of danger, boredom, tedious work and physical hardship. Sniper fire, enemy raids and artillery strikes are irregular hazards. Everyone's cold, wet, covered in mud and hungry most of the time. Soldiers adopt a kind of grim fatalism where nobody really expects to make it out alive. Even behind the lines and away from the immediate danger, Paul and his friends might find moments of happiness in their shared camaraderie, but privately they voice their regrets of the past and their fears of the future. It's a story that delves into the complex and often conflicting emotions felt by soldiers who fought in wars like that, the desire to go home and the fear of what that might bring, the hatred for the rules and discipline of army life, and the comfort and reassurance that order and structure can bring, the realisation that they'll never be the men they once were, that they can never truly forget the things they've seen and done. It's the musings of a lost generation who can already sense what they'll eventually become. Performances are excellent throughout, all of the main actors do a brilliant job bringing their characters to life, you really get a sense of the friendship and chemistry between them, especially Albrecht Schuch as Kat, who's able to switch from a tough and resourceful soldier to little moments of vulnerability as a husband and father, afraid of what he's going home to. But for fuck's sake, remember to watch it in the original German with subtitles and not the shitty dub version. I said before that the film deviates a bit from the original source material and for once it actually feels pretty appropriate. The ending's bigger and more action packed than the original while keeping the same basic chain of events and bleak messaging, although you could probably argue that it's not very historically accurate. Most of the shooting on the final day of the war was done by artillery because they couldn't be arsed hauling away all the excess shells when the war was over. <laughs> sure, yeah, okay. There's also a subplot about the German high command as they reluctantly concede the war is lost and peace is the only only option. It's not exactly essential to the narrative, but it gives some much needed context for people that might not know the history, especially nowadays, and how the seeds of fascism were first sown by the betrayal of a humiliating peace treaty. And as always for films like this, the contrast between generals and diplomats living in obscene luxury far from the front lines, deciding the fate of men toiling away in mud and squalor is as jarring as it is unfair. There's not a huge amount I can offer here in terms of criticisms. I mean, if I had to be super harsh, I'd say the film's budget constraints sometimes show through during the big battle scenes, where it's pretty obvious they had to use VFX for the flamethrowers, tanks and big overhead shots, but honestly, it's nothing but a minor observation that's gone before you really notice it. The soundtrack occasionally feels out of sync with what's going on, and for some reason I'm weirdly reminded of Das Boot. Either way, none of this stuff should detract from the fact that All Quiet on the Western Front is an excellent adaptation of one of the most powerful anti-war stories of all time, a film that makes absolutely no concessions to THE MESSAGE or MODERN AUDIENCES and delivers the kind of harrowing experience that'll stay with you long after that final scene. So for me, it gets a well-deserved drinker recommends. Anyway, that's all I've got for today. Go away now. <laughs>